Highly Skeptical Podcast, Episode 2. Today we have Peter Berry with us. He is a really good friend of mine and filmmaker. So Peter, tell us about the film Harry's Metaphysical Day Off. Harry's Metaphysical Day Off is a uh, slacker film. All my films are uh, pretty much like in the slacker genre. They amount to people hanging out, talking, arguing making an ass of themselves as whatever else unfolds around them. Essentially, it's two friends and a hooker that hang out all day talking about the coming technological singularity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is the technological singularity? Okay, so this is uh, generally uh, referred to in one of two ways. It is uh, considered, in, in one regard, it is when technology begins advancing so rapidly it will resemble a straight line. In 1999, I was at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and I took a class called Technology and Civilization. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the intersection of technology and civilization. The printing press, uh, to the airplane, to the television, to the computer. It's a review of how technology has uh, propelled civilization. And at the end of the semester, everybody got to do a report. This is the spring of 99. I had just seen The Matrix. So I go to the professor, who's cool. She's, oh, I forget her name. She was so cool, older lady. I was like, hey, I want to do mine on artificial intelligence. She's like, knock yourself out. <laughs> and so I read The Age of Spiritual Machines by Ray Kurzweil, a uh, scientist, inventor, and futurist. Absolutely brilliant man. He has invented all sorts of things. You look him up, you'll read everything he's invented. He's yeah, just a lot a, of practical inventions. He's, he's all capital letters, a fucking genius. But Ray... In the age of spiritual machines, he talked about basically everything we we're discussing. And then in 2004, he wrote the follow-up, The Singularity is Near, uh, which is much more well-known. They made a documentary about it. It's made Ray super famous. I was on board after the age of spiritual machines. And Ray is a believer that they will be sentient, and they will have feelings and be spiritual and... Thus, the name of the book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. Mm -hmm. Ray Kurzweil is the greatest proponent of the singularity. And he is how I got into all of this. So if you were to look at mankind from the discovery of fire and tools, the Stone Age, you know, the wheel, and his technological advancements, there it's, it's, it's almost a... Uh, what, I guess a, a horizontal line. Yeah, and then it linear, comes, right? And then it comes to... Uh, Later technologies, uh, mechanical understanding, plumbing, building structures, and then you come to the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago, and it starts diagonally moving upward. We reach the Information Technology Revolution uh, of computers in the mid-century, and then you know, uh, the scientific advancements, and then it starts going up at an even higher rate, and then the technological singularity will be when it... it begins to resemble a straight line. Okay, so basically mm -hmm. what you're saying is we have been developing and accelerating technologies mm -hmm. and it's going to keep happening to a point in space-time where we aren't exactly sure what's going to happen. But what It will be difficult to plot or predict what will happen next because technology will begin advancing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. That was one. The other one is it's a point where we develop AI... Uh, that surpasses human comprehension, and we merge with it. Ah, okay. The, so, the point when man and machine truly become merged. Right. With artificial superintelligence, ASI. So ASI, mm -hmm. um, in terms of like computing power, mm -hmm. um, if there was like a scale for how much more intelligent well, AI would mm -hmm. be than humans at the time of the singularity. All right, well, I can tell you this. Okay, so there are a myriad of workings and understanding of the way the brain does all of the uh, amazing, incomparable, incomprehensible things that the human brain can do. But it does work at a rate of computation. And we have recently, in the last few years, achieved computers that uh, it's, it's about 20 quadrillion, uh, it amounts to instructions per second or... Uh, or petaflops, I, I, I'm mis, uh, naming the terminology. Of, there's a terminology at how they measure computation. Mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and there is a difference. There's uh, petaflops, 
And then there's computations per, uh, per second, and I, I get them mixed up often when I'm, I'm reading about the subject matter. I'm not a computer scientist. Right. I'm not, you know, this is, I'm just a, a guy who enjoys far-flung subject matter and reading about it and conveying the ideas presented in a, in a, uh, a way that anybody can understand. Right. They, they call you a singulitarian, mm-hmm. right? Is that, is that one of the Well, uh, that, well a, a real one would be someone who works in the fields and is... Uh, working to achieve these technologies. Yeah. I'm more of a fan. But the point being, though, that uh, the human brain, it, it's it, I want to say it's 20 quadrillion instructions. I, I miss, I'm saying it incorrectly per second or, uh, or, or petaflops. But that is the rate at which the brain actually does function. And supercomputers now can do, can work at that rate and greater. But again, without all of the understanding and uh, as far as, you know, we understand thus far, the magic that the brain can do. Yeah, so uh-huh. the uh, AI that we have currently in 2017 would be defined as narrow AI. A&I. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be artificial narrow intelligence. A machine can beat you at chess. It can uh, beat you at Go. Um, if you saw, if you watched IBM Watson win Jeopardy, like Siri, it can be spoken to and it can speak in a relatively uh, somewhat human matter in answering questions and in, in fielding uh, endless information and replying instantaneously as though in conversation. But if you watch when IBM Watson won Jeopardy or if you interact with Siri, you know, it's also fraught with all kinds of misunderstanding and, right. and that there are yeah, breaks in conversation. We're at the base, base level right now of it interacting with us uh in speech okay uh-huh. everything the brain does uh and <clears throat> how little uh power our organic brain you know uses to conduct these massive computations and calculations it should be stated that the human brain project and the human brain initiative are two huge projects currently underway in which we are trying to reverse engineer how the brain does everything okay. it does um, and really? apply it in part to computer science. Okay. And I would just like to say right now we're enjoying <laughs> decoy Cabernet Sauvignon and Schneider's Pretzels. Schneider's Pretzels, the unofficial sponsor of my entire life. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Why is the event of the technological singularity so important for humankind? What does it mean for humankind? In the end, in addition to um, merging with machines and the, uh, the virtual reality that we can uh, get into and live into, and 3D printing, and all these other uh, technologies that will come with the technological singularity, one of the ultimate goals is the life extension, anti-aging, and, uh, or if you will, the cure for death. Yeah. Immortality. Now, that's something mm-hmm. that's of interest to everybody for, mm-hmm. for the entire course of human history. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been dying. It's, it's been mm-hmm. a huge problem. I don't know if you ever heard about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody knows what happens after. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that it's possible that after the technological singularity, we will have sort of ways around death. Well, you know, we uh, first with, uh, you know, we could have uh, medical nanobots that repair us and rebuild us on the cellular level with gene editing, with uh, genetic engineering. Uh, we can, there could be anti-aging applications. Mm -hmm. We could, ultimately in time, you know, uh, on a base level, what exists between our ears is information. And if we can translate that, if we can break it down and understand it enough to where we can translate that information to a hard drive with our consciousness, well then, you know, then you will definitely live forever. Now, will it be you 2.0? Yeah, the organic you is going to die. There's yeah. no getting around that. But it could be a U 2.0, you know, transferred to uh, an Android. Or uh, perhaps, you know, in time, there's talking about we could grow organs in a lab. And what's to say they couldn't grow a body? Right. And then we could uh, transfer your consciousness to a new body. So now it's, mm-hmm. it's almost like they're talking about death more as a, mm-hmm. a disease than an inevitability. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, there's also, there's talk of uh, artificial neurons to refresh... Uh, the mind or the brain, as it were, mm-hmm. um, and you know, then you have uh, emergency glutaraldehyde perfusion, the the plasticization of the brain, uh, which they can do now. They can do that now, 
And then they believe that if they can plasticize the brain within an hour of the end of your heart and lungs and the brain receiving oxygen, because what it does is it'll plasticize it and they can take a, a nano slice of it and then they can have it down to all the neurons, etc. And there is the idea is at a later date, a far flung date, with greater science and computation and understanding, they could fire it back up. Oh, okay. So uh-huh. there's a lot of like assumptions being made, and the assumptions are yeah. coming from the current rate of technology that we have now. Mm-hmm. It's something called like Moore's Law, right? That's um, right. So, <clears throat> mm-hmm. Gordon Moore coined the phrase, and he talked about how in the or- originating age of computation uh, in the mid-century, of uh, 20th century, computational power seemed to double every year and a half. Uh, and it has then it slowed to uh, every two years, and it continues to uh, skyrocket today. Uh, though though many see around sometime in between 2020 and 2030 that it will slow down tremendously, uh, short of new discoveries, or um, you know th- there's talk of 3D integrated circuits giving us greater computation. There's talk of quantum computing, which is very uh, it's controversial. D Wave is working on that. They have uh, relationships with uh, Lockheed Martin, and they have real financial backing. And there, there's talk that with quantum computing, you could see computation skyrocket if they can really make it happen. There's probably a lot more that say that they will not than right. say that they will. So right now, and so there is a computational barrier, and that's one of the strongest arguments against. Uh, artificial superintelligence and the technological singularity. Right. So right now, basically, it's it's the idea that what we're able to do with uh, silicon and computers, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. what we could, the amount of processing power that silicon has is eventually going to uh, run out. We're not going to be able to fit any more um, sophisticated processing power on a certain amount of silicon space. So could you go into a little more detail if... When we hit this block where silicon mm-hmm. isn't allowing us to accelerate mm-hmm. AI any longer, mm-hmm. um, could you just go into a little more detail about some of the other options, like you were just talking about, mm-hmm. um, molecular computing and uh, quantum computing, how it can uh, bridge the gap to the technological singularity? See, and this is where I have to admit that as a fan, I'm exhibiting faith. There's the critics of the singularity, tech, those of us who believe in the technological singularity, they say that uh, it's our religion. You know, like, because we reject religion and we've made this our religion. Uh, And this is the leap of faith because it's my belief in Google. It's my belief in Apple. It's my belief in MIT. My belief uh, in IBM, uh, IBM Synapse and IBM Watson. uh, That with enough funding, these guys that are working on this, that are the computer scientists and the the computer wizards, almost like uh, Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, computation will find a way. I'm not saying it's preordained, but I believe uh, that these brilliant men with the financial backing at, at these institutions determined, and they will make this work. And because there is financial rainbow at the end of this, and in the end, you know, um, in fiction, it's always it's it's war that's going to drive this technology. But in the end, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be self-driving cars and automated transportation. That's yeah, products. That's right. And then after that, I believe it'll be a companionship or a uh, your AI boyfriend or girlfriend, mm-hmm. uh, or um, as the not to be crude, but like sex doll technology, yeah, um, is gotten to a place where like from ten feet away, you know, um, some of these sex dolls look really real, <laughs> and in time you may have limited uh, mobility, such android dolls with an AI persona. I think when it gets to a level where it can the the speech interaction is more fluid and more natural and it can pass the uh the turing test where you can't tell if you're talking to a machine or a human right um i think it'll always be spockish you'll always know that it's not really human but i think people won't care i think that the the partnership for for people for lonely people there'll be a financial windfall for that there'll be a a, a rainbow at the end of that rainbow that'll fuel the technology also Okay, so in anticipation of the technological singularity happening, mm-hmm. you admitted to having some faith. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's something that you want to happen. Another thing that I wanted to talk about were the possible outcomes to the technological singularity. Because that we call it a singularity means that we don't have full understanding of, of exactly mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to run through the other ideas you had, or the other ideas that were out there, other popular theories as to what's going to happen once the technological singularity takes place. Well, you know, I'm a libertarian, which means I'm a capitalist. But AI, I believe, will take over all production. And there will be a very difficult period, an entire generation in which um, governments are going to have to uh, subscribe to uh, a deep, widespread kind of socialism to carry the populace. Because when half the people are out of work, what else are you going to do? And what are we going to, I mean, you know the old saying, you know, when there is nothing left, the poor will eat the rich. <laughs> yeah. But uh, let's uh, back up a little, mm-hmm. um, because the one thing we do know for sure about the technological singularity is, for the first time, we're going to be dealing with an intelligence mm-hmm. and a power that's greater than ours. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people wonder if that is going to be a benevolent force, or if it's going to be malicious. I'm utterly convinced it will be benevolent. Because we're making it, we're programming it, we're creating it, and its duty will be to serve us. There is one caveat that we must not engage in, and uh, DARPA's doing this and they need to stop. It's the development of the autonomous... Right now we're in an era of narrow artificial intelligence, A&I. Um, that's going to lead to AGI, artificial general intelligence, and that is uh, seed AI, where it can uh, self-improving. It can rewrite its own code better and better and better until it achieves artificial superintelligence. Right. There are some that say that uh, it'll be a brief period. There's some that are saying it could be an hour and a half, <laughs> which is interesting. The uh, seed AI, the autonomous warbot that can rewrite its own code and self-improve, you know, the, the warbot with seed AI... We must not build. Why is that? Because if that falls into the wrong hands, the the devastation that could be wreaked, you know, is uh, l- look at what nineteen assholes did with four airplanes, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it changed <laughs> the fucking world, man. <laughs> yeah, no more toothpaste on the airplane. I mean, you know, they 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 took down the towers. You know, th- these guys wreaked absolute havoc with four planes. Imagine, uh, now not to cite just those kinds of terrorists, it could be homegrown terrorists, it could be any kind of terrorism, yeah. but in the wrong hands, yeah. if one self-improving, you know, warbot is reprogrammed for maliciousness, and it does it better and better and better and better, that's terrifying. Yeah, it's just, That's the Terminator, that's the Matrix, you know? It's, it's the idea that uh-huh. the, the 9-11 attack uh, was unprecedented, because it was using technology um, that... that is supposed to better our lives well, and yeah. just no one ever fucking thought that it would be a weapon well know, but... i don't know i mean they that was the plot of the film executive decision mm-hmm. that's what always blows me away or not to digress but <laughs> it's like the cia says we know we never planned for that really you never went to the fucking movies <laughs> anyway yeah another potential outcome of the technological singularity is we could see different divisions in humankind mm-hmm. earlier you were referring to people who would use augmentation, mm-hmm. nanobots to help uh-huh. keep themselves alive, maybe to make Keep you younger, s- stronger. Yeah, smarter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you feel like maybe there may be some religious sects of people who mm-hmm. don't want to be augmented Fuck with em. technology? <laughs> well, do, you, do yeah. you think there's going to be some conflict between maybe some, some naturalists or some purists and, and some people who are embracing the technology? Do you feel like... Any, uh, hey, you know, conflict? there will be human purists... And you go on, right on, living and dying with your 120 IQ. Go ahead, baby. Do your thing. Me? I want to be the bionic man. <laughs> Six million dollar man, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you don't think um, there, there could be any war or violence between those two oh, types of people? No, 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 no. I, I don't fear that. Mm-hmm. Another thing I wanted to point out was having faith in a technological singularity is this Mm -hmm. uh, idea either our generation or the next generation is uh, no longer going to have to contend with death and a lot of the problems that we're facing today in our modern society with artificial intelligence if we had that it would be solved quite easily Mm -hmm. do you feel like hoping for the technological singularity in the future Mm -hmm. gives apathy for people today i I don't know it's not so much an apathy but um 
if they feel like, you know, like, um, we don't got to do right by us in the time we live in, I guess that sucks, you know? Mm-hmm. That's, um, but humans are pretty good about trying to do right, you know? Yeah. For whatever they can, however they can. I think I do. I definitely think, you know, AI will take over all production. Humans will not have to work for a living. It may take a generation or two. Uh, once the singularity kicks in. But by 2100, I can't envision a world in which humans are working. Mm-hmm. Other than, you know, like uh, artisan employment. Yeah, because art's going to be one of those things that, that yeah. lingers on. It's always going to yeah, be human. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. And I believe that they will solve all of our medical problems. There will be radical abundance. You may still have, okay, maybe not 2100, maybe uh, 2150, you know. But um, in time, everyone will be on board. And we'll be in uh, another evolution of humanity. All right. And you were speaking of people not having to work, uh, mm-hmm. people living for much longer, mm-hmm. um, going into virtual realities mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, bending time, living longer. Mm-hmm. Um, humans have always been defined as creatures with a finite existence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 90 years, you know, mm-hmm. 500 years ago, maybe like 30, 40 years. How do you feel like the technological singularity is going to change what it means to be a person. You know, we're living forever, and it's virtual. We're plugged in. You're oh, oh okay, okay. So, I believe one of the, the great challenges that we're going to have to face as the singularity approaches is to define uh, what it means to be human and to retain that. Because uh, I think one of the things that'll happen is that we're all going to go into the immersive virtual reality with sensation you know like inception or the matrix yeah i mean we kind of do this now on facebook we spend a yeah, lot of time that's right and virtual. and and you, you and if you can do it with sensation forget it everybody's gonna plug in and you're gonna have it'll be a crisis of people not living in a real world people living in a virtual world mm-hmm. in time and this is way far flung that you won't even be in an organic body you're not your original one or your next one or an augmented one that's a cyborg or just a full on android iron man android or you know from there you'll just go to straight being plugged in you'll just have your consciousness plugged in you won't even bother with existing in a real world and you'll be god you know you can live every version of your life in every way you ever imagined and it's lucid and you're in control of it all and then once you've lived every version of it a thousand ways, you know, any way that you want, it's got to feel like, I thought about it really deeply when we were preparing to do this a week ago. One of the points of Harry's Metaphysical Day Off is the pursuit of the authentic life. Mm-hmm. That, that in the end, a machine could never be infatuated. You could never love someone for no fucking reason. A machine can't, but we can. Right. So uh, for all the um, good things uh-huh. that AI is going to bring to the table. There uh, are things that only we can do. Yeah. And uh, when you, you, your life is inauthentic, uh, it will become empty. And so then you have, to, you have to say then you want the dream, as it were, make it unlucid. It would be like, like your real life all over again where you didn't know what was going to happen next. Yeah. And you're a fucking piece of shit. You're not <laughs> fucking God. Because you'll be sick of being God. It'll be empty to be God. And in, in the end, what you'll want is the unlucid simulation. And it begs the question, because if we're going to end up in a simulation anyway, and we can control it six ways from Sunday a million times over, and then we get sick of it, in the end, what's left but the unlucid simulation again? Yeah. And then it begs the question, are, is this my unlucid simulation? Right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh-huh. that, that, that idea of a mm-hmm. simulation theory. Mm-hmm. If it is, it's malfunctioning. <laughs> What do you think is going to happen to humanity if the technological singularity doesn't take place? Do you feel like there's any uh, salvation in us? or If we uh, don't achieve artificial superintelligence... No, th- we're going to achieve some manner of... Uh, okay, maybe then not superintelligence. AI is moving forward. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's funny. There are aspects the uh, like the cryonic preservation and, and cryonic revival... Right now, that's science fiction. That's just fucking science fiction. It's cryonic people, not cryogenic. He's right. Yeah. <laughs> that, right now, is it's just no other way to say it. Science fucking fiction. Would I go for emergency glutaraldehyde perfusion or cryonic... Uh, what the fuck? Cry- cryonic the... vitrification? Well, yeah, yeah. Would I go for it? Uh, vitrification, thank you. Right now, uh, if I had the money, I would anyway. Yeah, yeah. Just because I'm going to be dead anyway. Yeah. What the just fuck I got to lose, man? <laughs> You know, 
No lie, that's far flung. That's science fucking fiction. But 30 years ago, AI was the Terminator, you know? It was total science fucking fiction. Mm -hmm. But we live in a world now where I think the average person can see AI is a coming. It's in going to be in self-driving cars, automated transportation. Um, you interact with Siri. Look, it's like this, IBM, Watson, and Siri. Okay, times 10, times 100, times 10,000. Just at times 10,000, you've achieved the Turing test. Right. You, uh, Let's talk about, like, You can't tell between if you're dealing with a human or a computer. And that's why I, how I try to explain it to people, you know. AI is a coming, and AI is going to... We're going to interact with it. We're going to be uh, partners with it. I mean, like in the film Her, you're going to date it. You might or might not have a limited mobility, flesh-feeling sex doll that goes with it. People think, you know, I'm being crude when I talk about these things, but these things are coming. Right. And believe me, huh? you read a lot about the things that women don't like about men. You don't read so much about the things that men don't like about women. Wait till AI... <laughs> And limited mobility, flesh feeling sex doll, sex dolls hit the market. You're gonna find out men are done with you too. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> I digress. Men and women are in a whole other subject matter. Definitely. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, uh, <clears throat> about consciousness. Okay. So, <clears throat> the leading theory of consciousness is the thalamocortical loop. Okay. What's that? And this is it's essentially the part of the brain that takes in. Uh, the parts of the brain take in the senses and uh, the part of the brain makes memories and the language part of the brain in a never-ending loop. And that loop is what we perceive to be consciousness. Because that's, you know, you can see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, feel it, or uh, see it, hear it, touch it, taste it. What's the other fucking sense? Bob it. <laughs> what the fuck? There's five. God, yeah. you, wait, God damn it. Hold on. See it, hear it, Smell it. Yes. That's the bun I always fucking forget because I have a shitty sense of smell. And then you can remember it in all those ways and you can articulate it. That's, and that's what it is. It's, it's a loop. There is a, within the brain a, like a neuronal loop. And so that if we can preserve that, the picture of it, the belief is artificially fired back up. You 2.0. Right. The brain is such a mystery. And we have the Human Brain Project... And the Brain Initiative, uh, these huge multi-billion dollar projects designed specifically to reverse engineer the brain, understand the brain, how it does everything it fucking does, you know? So how does uh, reverse engineering the human brain... Uh... You can apply, uh, and to understand how it computes all that it does and to apply that to computation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That is essentially IBM Synapse is working on that. In a, in a very crude, rudimentary level yeah. at the moment. At the moment, like we don't have, mm. we don't even have like sufficient MRI scanning to look at the brain yet. Is that right? Oh, it's getting better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can see what parts of the brain are doing what during what activities. We're on the ground level, and it's a hundred floors. You know. Yeah. But they're on the second floor. <laughs> We're on our way, and you know, the first seven years of the Human Genome Project, they got one percent. And on the other seven years, you know, they got the other 99? Yeah. That's how it works. There's a key at one point. At some point, you cross the key, and you have it. And they will do it, as they did with the Human Genome Project. Genetic engineering is a fait accompli. It's coming. Anti-aging is coming. I had a friend of mine that majored in neuroscience named Devin. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this once, about 10 years back, when I was working at Louisiana Pizza Kitchen. And uh, she said, you know, because she studies the brain and neuroscientists, and she said that, you know, like... Um, the complexity is, is too difficult to transfer as information to a hard drive. She patently did not believe that. And I have to take that as credible. She's a neuroscientist, you know. Yeah. Um, and she said that also, too, that even with regenerative or like artificial neurons or nanobots repairing and rebuilding on a cellular level, she talked about, you know, that the human brain, like the heart, you know, it, it's good for X. Past X, it's no good. One of the keys to a long life is heart health. Smaller, thinner people live longer than everybody else. I believe it's Costa Ricans, Okinawans, and, and uh, might be, uh, I forget the other nation. They're historically smaller, thinner people, and they live on average longer than everybody else. Yeah. And they also all practice like upper body cardio, and they have like a fish diet. And it, it's a heart health life. Small, thin, upper body cardio. They're not alcoholic or drug cultures. Point being, though, like just as you look at heart health, 
for life longevity. The brain is, you know, because the brain is, because the, the heart is, is good for X amount, billions of beats, you know. And the smaller and thinner you are, the slower your resting heart rate. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, it, 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 it's almost how it breaks down. Yeah. It's, it's very curious, very curious. Which is not to say that there aren't taller or larger people that haven't lived a long time. Certainly, there, there have been. And certainly, there are smaller, thinner people that have passed away sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. But uh, in general. Yeah. And she said that the brain is, past 120 years, the brain just, it's like an, uh, any other organ, you know? It, yeah, it's just no good past that date. And so, it might be that we keep ourselves younger and stronger and healthier and with replaceable organs grown in a lab and artificial neurons, but in the end, 120 might be the max. Yeah, organic mm-hmm. organic life just can't sustain past In that. the end, you're organic. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. The deterioration is going to... You can delay it, but it's going to get you. Mm-hmm. With the Human Brain Project and the Brain Initiative, if they can deduce what's between our ears and transfer that to a hard drive, that's it. It's all... If we do get the, to this point where we're able to mm-hmm. reverse engineer the human mm-hmm. brain um, mm-hmm. and understand it, um, that's going to lend itself greatly to programming emotions into artificial intelligence. Or implanting memories, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's going to change the way we think about love, and you were talking about mm-hmm. sex bots earlier mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. things like that. But could you go into a little more detail about the difficulties of programming emotions into artificial intelligence? To me, as organic creatures that, that have evolved... We have developed qualities to get us here, such as nature. You know, it's natural selection. Mm -hmm. So we are, humans made it this far because we are horny, aggressive, territorial, tribal, similar-seeking primates. Those qualities got us to here. Those qualities give us desire. They give us passion. They give us anger, you know, because they're developed over, uh, you know, what, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Yeah. Machine doesn't have that unless um, you build a war bot. That's why I always, my perception of AI is going to be Spock. How Spock is depicted in the Star Trek films, that yeah. to me is what AI will be. Now, they'll give it different, uh, like, you know, when you talk to Siri, she sounds like, oh, hi. You know? <laughs> mine actually has, I give mine an Australian accent. I roll the Australian accent. Is oh, it? yeah. <laughs> um. In the end, like, like Spock sounds like a computer. He won't sound like a computer. It'll sound like a human. But it'll be Spock in its perception, you know, of... Or uh, it, it might have a little bit of range of, like... You remember in, um, uh, what was that damn movie with uh, Matthew McConaughey, Christopher Nolan film? What's it, Interstellar, Interstellar. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that. Okay, well, um, he, there's a computer, and it, it's programmed to have a sense of humor. And he says, sense of humor less 10%. <laughs> so, it'll have... Imitation emotions, but it won't really be emotional. Even even the super intelligence AI you're talking about? Yeah, it won't be organic. Our anger, our passion, our desire is organic. So, In the end, machines are inorganic. So, but there'll still be love affairs between AI and, and humans. Oh yeah, think, right. Oh now, okay, yes. Uh, we will love them like a partner, yeah. Because have you ever seen those memes where it's upside down letters, backwards letters? And, um, like, the at and question marks and stuff. And it says, um, you can read this because you're a human being and your mind can adapt. And, you know, we'll fill in the blanks. There'll be, of course, we'll know it's false, but we will allow it. Like, when we go to the movies, suspension of disbelief. Right. We will allow it. And so we will love it. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, cool. So do you think that that changes the definition of love just because... I feel like there's there's always been a, a debate um, in human history, especially uh, mm-hmm. since Darwin, you know, mm-hmm. came up with his mm-hmm. ideas. Uh, the idea here basically is that we used to think, for most of the time, uh, that you know God is love, and you know man loves woman, and it's this like really awesome thing. Um, but now, like a lot of scientists and philosophers are just saying that what we feel for other people is just mm-hmm. kind of like the selfish thing. It's a biological imperative. Um, if we had no mm-hmm. desire to breed we wouldn't have these types of relationships. So do you feel like in the future, AI is going to address this this issue mm-hmm. between the, this seeming conflict between love and the biological imperative? I believe that uh, as primates, we are social. So, the, you know, we were designed from all along that, you know, to pair up. That's just our nature. We pair up. 
But, oh no, I've had enough now. Thank you. I've had enough Schneider's pretzels. <laughs> Delicious Schneider's pretzels. Without the biological imperative, you know what I mean? AI will be, uh, it'll be more like a hive mind. Then we'll pair up, organic us will pair up with it, and we're going to merge with it. And that's that discussion of what do we want to retain of humanity? I want to retain love. I, want to, I think that's our ultimate defining characteristic. Yeah. And love being, it's that balance between, yes, the feeling of, but the act of, the commitment. You know, you can love a thing. You can love playing guitar if you're committed to it, you know? Yeah. You can love going to the movies if you're committed to it. So the act of committing yourself to one person that you're paired up with and the feeling it gives you and vice versa. I want to retain that. AI will, you know, it'll do whatever we program it to do. Yeah. Will it truly be sentient? I don't think so. It'll be property. Um, it'll be a thing. I have a concept for a script. It's called Sex Machines. <laughs> it's about two sex androids that fall in love. I'm, I'm here, I'm saying that, that I don't believe that's going to happen. But that's the whole point of that story. It's kind of a contradiction. Yeah. I've created a story where that happens. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, so throughout this podcast, we have been addressing the different ideas surrounding the technological singularity. And whenever we've come across a specific barrier, we've sort of given a, a conditional proof for, okay, what if we do figure this out? What happens next? So mm -hmm. what if the technological singularity does take place? What if mankind does get to that point? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess the next question would be how far... What's going to happen? How far can we mm -hmm. go? What does it mean for our progress? Mm -hmm. we got to figure out way, way later, you know, we're going to leave Earth. And I think by then you'll be, whatever you are, it'll just be on a hard drive in a simulation. You, you, you'll cease to be in a real world. Yeah. It'd be no point. So that's going out into the stars, and uh, I mean, does it just is that just it? Well, we have you know? we have a need to go into the stars um, because mm -hmm. that's always we've always mm -hmm. had like an inherent like need to. What explore. is it they say in five billion years? You know, that like, too. Uh, sun's besides, gonna squall the earth anyway. Besides the uh, exploring aspect, um, mm -hmm. we're going to have an expiration date on this planet, yeah. um, no matter how you yeah. slice it. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be of great interest of us um, to start. You know, living out in space, finding other Earth-like uh, planets where we could continue uh, our lineage. As it stands now, that seems to be a very uh, mm -hmm. diminished prospect. You know, here's one of the things about artificial superintelligence. Artificial superintelligence will deduce everything that is possible within the laws and properties of the universe. Full stop. ASI will do it. It'll get us there. It'll take us there. It'll get us in touch with anybody else that's out there, which I would presume is uh, a machine intelligence. If there is another yeah. being out there. You know, it's one right of the now. things that we talk about in Harry's Metaphysical Day Off is that when you look at the universe, it's the same thing over and 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 over again. It's gases and particles and molecules and it's stars and it's planets. Over and 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 over again. With a lot of the same elements. It almost begs the wonder, is it doing this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to create life that could evolve to achieve intelligence, to achieve computation, to surpass organic intelligence, to achieve superintelligence, so the universe itself may come alive so, and for what greater good what greater purpose to well well what does the universe do it expands unendingly does it want to stop itself from expanding uh does it want to contract and expand again i don't know i'm not a universe i don't know what a universe wants yeah. but um there is that whole that my that's my wide view is that it does this in all corners repeatedly and I, I it, 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 and you look at what evolves, and it does it because it's so difficult for life to develop, to evolve, to achieve intelligence, to achieve computation, to achieve super intelligence. It might be, if you break it down, and each step is one in a million, that there's us and maybe, I don't know, a few hundred or a few thousand in the entire universe with 10 trillion planets, you know? Precisely, it does this so much because it's so difficult. But it, this is what it's pursuing. This is its reason for being. But for for us to uh, colonize, to go to other planets, we're gonna need like way more sophisticated spaceships and stuff. And of course, that's something that AI is definitely gonna be able to address. 
But I think there's one uh, immutable law of physics right mm-hmm. now. Um, that is going to make all mm-hmm. the difference uh, if we're going to mm-hmm. be this uh, super being uh, in which the universe wakes up. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's the speed of light. I think it's the speed limit. I think it's legit. Yeah. So if the speed mm-hmm. of light is mm-hmm. the speed limit in mm-hmm. the universe, uh, what does that mean mm-hmm. for us? We can't really spread a co- across the cosmos. No, but I, I do believe that... Um, okay, so um, there's a guy, Michio Kaku, mm-hmm. well-known... Uh, Community College of New York, I believe it's called, uh, professor of science, physicist. Uh, he's on a lot of the Discovery Channel science shows yeah, and such. Yeah, pop physicist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he does like a lot of the physics of Star Trek and etc. He does like a lot of far flung discussions because it's cool subject matter, like what we're, we're talking about. He says there's type one, type two, type three civilization. We're type zero. Well, uh, g- give us some credit, Peter. We're more right. like a, a point seven. <laughs> well, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. A type one civilization is is a planetary one. That's, That's right. Yeah, okay. It's able to, uh-huh. to to harness all the available energy on the planet and use. Okay, it. thank you. You yeah. recall better than I. Yeah. Uh, like I couldn't remember the uh, the instructions, the petaflops and instructions. Yeah. Okay, and then type two would be the harness power of a star. Type three harness the power of a galaxy. All right. Um, to open and close a wormhole takes the entire energy of a galaxy. So that would be a type three. And a type 3 civilization, if you can harness the power of a galaxy, you know everything from the Alpha to the Omega. It's, there is nothing unknown. But there is a belief that if you can do that, you could open and close wormholes in time, space-time. Mm-hmm. And we learned uh, recently, in the last few weeks, some guys got the, uh, the fucking uh, Nobel Prize for science because they detected gravitational waves, space-time bends. Mm-hmm. Legit now. They knew it. They already knew it, but they proved it. Space yeah, time bands. Like the- theoretical. Uh-huh. Um, so what are, what are the implications of uh, discovering gravity waves? Well, if space time can bend, then if you can harness, if if, if you could ever, uh, I mean, this is science fiction, you know, but if you could harness the power of a galaxy, open and close a wormhole, space time can do it. Well, that, you know? that mm-hmm. uh, opening and closing a wormhole, mm-hmm. accessing those ports, that mm-hmm. means that we could find a way around the speed of light. Yes. Okay. And so we could populate the entire universe. But I, I believe straightforward without doing that speed of light is the speed limit yeah Mm -hmm. my theory on why the speed of light is the speed limit is uh, because if you could then you could time travel and there's no time travel because there's nobody coming from the future saying hey this is gonna happen you know what i'm saying yeah because it begs the reason well if it was possible people would be doing it and they aren't exactly so there's no time travel so nobody's going backwards in time so nobody's going faster than the speed of light um, it's kind of like um, my one of my reasons that I think this might be a simulation. Coincidence. It happens too often to be mathematically possible. Yeah. It really does. It really fucking does when you stop and think about it. Coincidence occurs with too great a regularity. That's, that's one of the reasons I think this is maybe a simulation. It's fun to think about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if we're able to populate the universe and we allow the universe mm-hmm. to wake up, I mean, that level of being, uh, the type 3 civilization mm-hmm. you're referring to, mm-hmm. that is almost analogous to That's God. That's total. It is. That, yeah. that is, every, you know, they would know everything from the Alpha to the Omega. So it's almost like God exists and we're manufacturing him uh-huh. now. Right? Maybe it's us, and yeah. this is the unlucid simulation, because that's all that's left once you've been God a million times over, and you just feel empty. And so you got to have not awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because once mm-hmm. you're at that point... You don't perceive time in a mm-hmm. linear fashion. The the past, the present, and the future all happen simultaneously. Yeah, and it's wild to think about. Yeah. <laughs> well, any closing thoughts, Peter? My closing thought is that uh, I believe it's going to happen, and Ray believes it's going to happen by twenty forty five. Uh, so he says between twenty twenty nine and twenty forty five. I guess he believes that's when we'll achieve uh, AGI, and then it'll be from AGI. He, he believes it'll skyrocket to ASI. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I say 2100 more likely. Maybe 2150. Definitely by uh, 2200, by the 23rd century. Definitely. Uh, if we can... I, I believe the men who are working on computation will find a way. There are things that will stop us from achieving the singularity. It's the worldwide devastation, human annihilation stuff. A super volcano an asteroid, a series of mega quakes and subsequent tsunamis, a pandemic. I don't subscribe to this, but there are some people that believe that in the next 100 years, 
Uh, we're going to have catastrophic climate change with uh, rising temperatures and sea levels. I don't believe that, but some people think so. Enough to interrupt humanity. Um, and then uh, the other one that I don't subscribe to, people think that, you know, aliens have been uh, watching us and we're going to be invaded <laughs> by aliens. Yeah. You know, one of the things we touch on in Harry's Metaphysical Day Off, one of the reasons I don't believe anyone has achieved Type 3 or that there, there are such aliens anywhere else in the universe, and if there is going to be that, it's going to be us, is because if they wanted to observe us, they could do it from afar. They could certainly send tiny machines um, und- that would be undetected. Yeah, like particle computers. Particle yeah, they, they would be undetected. Uh, they certainly wouldn't arrive here as organic beings unless they were um, growing them in a lab to send them somehow. For some reason, they had to send an organic thing uh, for some reason because they couldn't arrive as information or as uh, small bots, whatever. Mm-hmm. But even with that, though, if they can traverse wormholes, they know, every, as I say, that means they're type 3. They know everything from the alpha to the omega. They have no reason to study us because they already know everything. Um, but even if they did, they could do it from afar. Even if they wanted to come, uh, they could do so undetected. And even if they did, they certainly wouldn't fucking crash in New Mexico. That's why I say, like, no, that's not. And also, too, I think that they would be so advanced, they could communicate with us all mentally, telepathically. Yeah. Brainwaves isn't just a term, you know. You know, when we talk about being on the same wavelength, the same frequency, uh, certainly, you know. Um, That's another point uh-huh. you could extrapolate mm-hmm. um, from the technological singularity, that today mm-hmm. we're all on the internet now. We're all, mm-hmm. Our minds are sort of congregating mm-hmm. in this one, like, nexus. Hi, we're moving to the hive mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you said AI is mm-hmm. going to have hive mind. Yeah, we're going to be a part of it. Uh-huh. It's going to be all of us and the super intelligence. Or you're you're going to be you and everyone and it. So uh, uh-huh. it, it, there's going to be like a uh-huh. weird oneness. It, and once again, yeah. like evoking uh-huh. the, the concept of God, uh-huh. um, lying is, yes. the, it, yes. there's going to uh-huh. be a complete transparency of thought. Uh-huh. Uh, lies uh-huh. are going to be uh, abolished. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that, um, I think that uh, it's going to be good. You know, we're going to have obstacles, but it's going to be good. We're going to pursue a truly human existence, but we want to retain that humanity. We want to retain love. And if we do that, we'll be all right. Short of those uh, worldwide devastations, I think that uh, it, we're on an inevitable track. The guys and gals at Apple, at MIT, at Facebook, Google, and IBM Watson and IBM Synapse. And then you have everybody on the Human Brain Project, everybody on the, the Brain Initiative. These are brilliant minds, and they got funding, and they're determined. I'd say after love... The next thing I would say I want to retain is that human determination. Ain't nothing tougher than human determination. Nothing in the universe. Well, awesome, Peter. Thanks for being on the podcast today. Uh, mm-hmm. If people wanted to check out your movies, maybe see Harry's Metaphysical Day Off, how could they do that? Ah, Google Peter Barry. Yeah, he's actually got mm-hmm. the whole movie streaming on IMDM because they took it down off YouTube, didn't they? Those yes, guys. because I used what I thought was royalty-free music, and it wasn't, <laughs> so they took it down. But if you go to IMDB and you search Peter Barry, B-E-A-R-Y, you can find Harry's Metaphysical Day Off and you can watch it. And you should because it's a great little uh, hour-long uh, philosophical dialogue. Uh, a lot of the same stuff we were talking about here. And there's a great monologue about warbots. <laughs> That's true. And a little, uh, some, some other good stuff about uh, sex bots too. Hell yeah! That was the Highly Skeptical Podcast. This is Ryan Sarblow. If you're interested in checking out any of my books, my latest release is a psychological thriller revolving around the failure of the war on drugs. It's called Writer, Seeker, Killer. Go to my website at www.starblow.com. And if you can't spell that, check in the YouTube notes below.